My name is Simon. I run a record label called Bella Union. It's an independent label that has been going for 25 years. And as well as that, I produce bands, I manage bands, I publish bands. I do lots and lots of things sort of in the vague area of music and r you know, helping bands get from A to B and making music myself. So pretty much everything there is to do in music, I'll, I've done it at least at some point in my very long life. Yeah, so my journey in music from doing, uh, being a musician and then into what I do more now as a, as a label kind of guy was, was not deliberate or um, planned at all. Just a complete accident. Um, so going back to when I was 15, you know, I heard the Sex Pistols and immediately wanted to be in a band and uh, learned how to play all the bass lines to never mind the bollocks in one afternoon and thought, okay, that's easy. This is going to be what I do for my life. <laughs> and uh, for the next few years, obviously, um, I did do that. I joined a band, started a band at school and then got signed for my very first proper band. And that led me into, you know, understanding a little bit more about what labels do. Signed to 4AD with my next band, Cocteau Twins, and remained making records with Cocteau Twins for the next 14 years. Our relationships with labels wasn't particularly good, so I learned quite a lot about what not to do. Um, and then decided that we would start a record label of our own to put out our own records so that we didn't have to talk to anyone else other than each other. Um, so that's how the label started. And then the band broke up six months later. So we had a label, but no band. So, so, so that's why I'm doing what I'm doing now is just a complete, complete accident because I never, um, never intended to run a record label. <laughs> But, you know, I just threw myself into it and having no band all of a sudden was, um, you know, gave me something to focus on, I think. Mm. And, you know, 25 years later, here we are. I don't really know how that happened or why I'm still doing it. But I guess I just love helping bands. I love music, love discovering things. And I just keep the same kind of childish enthusiasm for music that I had when I was listening to that Pistols record. You know, it's, that's the way I approach it. I don't look at it like a job. I look at it like a fun hobby that I like, you know? Mm. That's, my, that's my way of doing it. I mean, there's lots of different catalysts along the way, you know, when this happened or that happened, or you met this person, or you didn't meet that person, or, you know, there's loads of different events. It's hard to summarize a, a 40 year old, 40 career, 40 year old career in music in a couple of minutes, but, that was certainly being the youngest of four children. Um, all, my, all my brothers and sisters all had quite different musical taste to me. So when punk came along, 1976, I was actually 14, not 15. So I was 14 when I, um, when I first got into that. And it was like, oh, this is my thing. You know, I, I don't, I get my own little thing. Because my brother had his, you know, like Genesis and Little Feet and all them kind of 70s proggy bands. My sisters were all into pop music, Beatles and Beach Boys, and it was all fine, but it wasn't my thing. I, I liked it, but I didn't love it. And when, when punk came along, I was like, oh man, this this just really is is what it's all about. And I was the perfect age for it, you know? Because the next few years, <laughs> England was a fascinating place to be growing up. You know, Thatcherism, minor strikes. So I became very politically aware of at a relatively young age. Um, and punk taught me an awful lot of things about life, um, not just music. I, I, I mean, I, you know, I, I'm a socialist, so it's important to me in my life, and I follow it, and I care about things and people. But I'm, I'm so bored of politicians. They're just, you know, the way the world has gone in the last twenty years or so. I mean, it's, it's just it feels like we haven't gone anywhere. It feels like we've gone backwards gone back to how it was, but worse. And I, I feel so sorry for everybody because 
I thought we went through all this to make things better for our children, not worse. And it seems like it's gotten worse. Um, you know, all the kind of rock against racism things we did in the 70s and the anti-nuclear things. And, you know, it feels like, why do we bother? Because nothing seems to have changed at all. So that's quite depressing. <laughs> but um, I don't look at it as a... As a as a part of my musical career, it's, to it's, it's, it's my life, you know, my, how I think about things is, is a philosophy and stuff, but how, how I um, bring that into music, I don't really go there. I just sign bands purely on a feeling, uh, instinct, and politics doesn't come into it ever. Uh, you know, unless it's a band that I like totally relate to politically and I'm like, oh yeah, I want to support that, but um, I generally don't go there. Um, being signed to 4AD and, and, and um, Mercury, did it define how I wanted to run a label? No, quite the opposite. It defined how I didn't want to do it, actually. You know, uh, not that there was anything, you know, dramatically wrong. It's just there's certain behaviours. We, we, we went from an independent label for f whatever it was, uh, uh, 83 to like seven or eight years with 4AD to, to signing with a major. And um, the, the, the idea behind the move for us was, was sound at the time. But looking back on it, it was totally stupid. We went from like being kind of friends with our label um, to falling out with them a bit over money stuff, which is inevitable, I think, when you become successful. Um, and I know, don't need to go into that. And then signing with a, with a major, thinking, well, let's just be, we can just be anonymous here. We just get the money, make our own records. We don't have to be friends with anyone or talk to anyone. We just do our own thing. That, of course, is very naive <laughs> because no one gives you a large sum of money and doesn't want something in return. Um, and we were not those kind of people. We didn't want them involved. We didn't want them to come to the studio. <laughs> we were just like, not the, right, not the kind of right band for the label we signed to, for sure. And they realized it soon after we did. <laughs> so it was a mess. So, so running our own label was more like kind of, okay, well, we know what doesn't work. But, but to be honest with you, we never signed, we never wanted to sign any bands. That wasn't why we set the label up. We set the label up to release our own music and when the band broke up, I was like, oh, I suppose I, well, what else am I gonna do with my day? Oh, maybe I'll sign a band. You know, it was kind of like that. Yeah. So you end up doing something that you weren't ever expecting to do. So, so how it became was, was Really, I guess, um, yeah, as a result of the things I didn't like about the thing that, about what I'd seen previously. Oh, I don't think we should do it that way. We should do it this way. But I certainly didn't get it right for a long, long time because mm. I didn't know what I was doing. I'm not sure I still do. <laughs> um, has, the, has the ethos of the label changed at all? Over not really. No, the ethos of the label has not really changed at all. I mean, the world has changed. Music has changed, the music business has changed. Couldn't be more different than it was in the 80s. Well, we didn't have the internet, we didn't have mobile phones. Um, you know, and, and really, um, the internet had only just begun when, when we started our label. So, you know, we've sort of gone through quite a massive change in technology and, you know, streaming wasn't even a thing back then. So. The industry has changed massively, but my approach to it and my ethos is, is just about working with great people and not worrying about the business side of things because that will take care of itself or it won't. And if it doesn't, then you, you're not going to be doing the label anymore. You're going to be working on doing something else with your life. But I've just about got it right slightly more than I've got it wrong, which is probably why we're still here. You know, My, 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 my ethos is very simple. Like, be blown away by music. Find out if you like the people that, you, that you've been blown away by. Get to know them a little bit. If they're nice people and they're not gonna give you a headache, then maybe they'll be good people to have on the label. That's changed a little bit over the years because before I used to just sign bands because I love them. Didn't bother to try and need, need, feel the need to get to know them first. Now I really need to get to know them first. It's curating a stage for, for Sound and Vision, um, well, like any festival, though, and we've been doing quite a few already this year. Um, we went to South by Southwest last month and, and had, had uh, eight or nine bands playing there. It's something 
but it comes quite naturally. And we've got such a large roster, you know, probably 75 active bands on the label. So it's plenty to choose from. So sometimes you have to look at the event that you're being asked to curate and think about what works and then see who's around. Because um, right now or the last year, it's been really impossible to, to bring American bands in for th events like this because of COVID and whatnot. So for the most part, today's lineup is, because we obviously we, we arranged it before today, we've been arranging it over the last few months, bands that are around were, were easy access to, to Cambridge, easy to get to, UK-based bands or European-based bands, Pompoko Pompo from Norway, um, but they're touring here this week. So, you know, you have to think about that, the logistics, um, but it, it's all part of the same game, you know, whether I'm doing a radio show or whether I'm picking bands for a festival bill or choosing artists for the label. It's, it's all ultimately about curation, right? It's all about like me wanting to pass a good tip on to you. And it goes back to when I worked in a record shop. That's how I started in the music business, working in a record shop. I loved it when people would come in and say, what's new or that thing you gave me last week is amazing have you got anything else like that or what's come in this week and you begin a banter about music and we have it in our we have a record shop in Brighton which just sells our own label stuff and part of the joy of that is the banter helping people discover cool things that they didn't know about before because it helped me in my life this is the John Peel on the radio going into record shops when I was a kid my, I would not be here without those things my thoughts on vinyl are, it is, a, it is a beautiful thing to listen to music on, on, on vinyl. There's no greater joy as an artist than when you get your first record presented to you, whether it's by your label or you get it back from the pressing part. It's a joy, it's a beautiful thing. It's like holding a baby for the first time. It's um, special. Now for me, it's gonna be different than from, from, from a 20 year old now, because I'm 60 and I've been, Music records are all I've known since I was growing up, so I have a romantic, nostalgic connection to it as well as a business one. Um, and of course, I collect a lot of records and I buy on Discogs every day, pretty much. I'm, I'm a collector. Um, so on the one hand, it's a very big part of my life. On the other hand, I absolutely hate it right now because it's miserable. The process, the production problems that exist in the music business, it's almost destroying the industry. If I was a six, 15, 16 year old kid with a punk band and I was like, just made my first record, made in the studio, made my first album and gave it to the record label and like, okay, when, when can we get this out? The answer would be roughly a year, right? I'd be like, I can't wait a year. I, I, my band's ready to go now. So we never had that. Now this is a problem that bands have, and it's a problem now the industry have. So what do you do? Do you tell the band they can't put a record out today? Or they have to do a split release of a digital now and the physical later, which we've done plenty of in the last year, but it doesn't really work. It's, it's making the best of a bad job, which is what we're all trying to do. But all I seem to be doing for the last six months is delivering bad news to people. You know, oh sorry, record's not gonna be in the shop sometime. Why? I don't know. You know, it's just a mess. The plants are just oversubscribed. There's the supply and the demand are all over the place. And I don't see it getting any better anytime soon. I wish I did because I don't want to be disliking vinyl and starting to think maybe we should just not bother making a record. Just put it up on Spotify. I don't want to be that person. I don't think I would find putting records out interesting if all I did was stick it up on Spotify. Because to me, it's all about, well, it has always been about that physical product, having the bands go on to selling their records at the merch table. And right now it's just like, you know, it's a lot of misery out there. <laughs> and that's not my default setting. My default setting is happiness. So yeah, confusing, lots of confusing things going on with vinyl right now. Of course, I love it as a, as a commodity. But also worried about the ecological part of it too, because, you know, it's not a very green thing to be doing, making records. And that bothers me some. Well, 
That's a very big question. What am I excited about for next year? This year is our 25th anniversary, so I'm just going kind of day to day at the moment, just trying to get through this year. Um, I want to get back into the studio myself and start making music again, something I haven't been able to do for a year because of COVID and a million other things, domestic issues that are of no interest to anyone else other than me. Um, so yeah, get back to making some music. Um, and then next year, well, yeah, so obviously can't tell you what records are coming out because I'm not, I wouldn't be allowed to do that. But um, lots of new bands always, that, that's a huge big part of Bella Union. I think, you know, you look at the big artists like Beach House and Father John Misty and Spiritualized, Azure Farm and Mercury Red Flaming Lips, they're all established artists, you know, in their kind of 30s and 40s. But I'm just as excited about the sort of 16, 17, 18 year old kids that, that we that we find and help become the beach houses of the future. That's that's actually a huge part of it. And I know that the, the, the famous names tend to get all the press these days because there's less and less press. Um, and there's less and less room in the magazines for album reviews. So you tend to, if you've got five albums coming out in a month, it'll be the ones that most people have heard of that get the coverage. And the baby bands tend to kind of just get forgotten about. I'd like that to change, um, but that's part of the challenge. And if you don't wake up in the morning with a bit of a challenge, then you shouldn't get out of bed. Well, I just say follow your guts because that's pretty much all the decisions I've ever made are just because I thought they were the right decision or felt they were the right decision, whether it's signing a band or taking this job or joining this band or joining that band or having a relationship with this girl or that girl you know it's all about I feels right I'm going to go there without thinking about it too much now it can get you into trouble sometimes if you if you just follow your heart and follow your nose I think in music there the alternative isn't really any more sensible than that because you just don't know what is going to work I couldn't tell you what tracks are going to be successful I've got no idea why this track over that track becomes popular. I have no idea why this band nobody cares about, or this band everybody adores, because I've looked at it too many times and just found it mystifying. How can, how can you not like this band? I think it's the greatest band ever, but no one else likes it. So I gave up long ago in worrying about why, and I just think, just do it. If you feel it's right, then just crack on with it. And I say to most people like, well, what should I do in this circumstance? What, what do you feel is the right thing to do? Well, I don't know, maybe yeah, that's what you should go with. Because you've just as much chance of getting it right that way or the other way. And at least it's real and it's honest and it's authentic. And I think that's the way to go with everything. Just follow your guts.